Good morning and welcome to our Field Fisher Silicon Valley webinar, our second of 2020 on privacy compliance and going global. Thanks for joining us this morning. Um, I'm Charlie Gar, a trainee in the Silicon Valley team out here. And today I'm joined by Mark Weber, our US managing partner, Paul Lanois, a director in the team, and Megan Ward, a solicitor in the team. Uh, before we get started, um, just to let you know, we have got a few podcasts that we will be referring out to uh, throughout the webinar. Uh, they are part of our ongoing sort of a three-part podcast series on going global, but also on there are a few other podcasts and we will be looking to update that throughout the year with other anecdotal updates on privacy and sort of headline items. So Mark, we take us away. Good, thank you, Charlie, and uh, hello to everybody signed up today. Um, I think we've got record numbers tuning in, so it's really good to uh, keep the momentum going, and thanks for joining us. Um, and what a difficult topic we've chosen for today's webinar, a glowing global, looking at the impact of the globe's privacy laws, or at least looking at the privacy laws in the countries in which you operate, sell, or partner. Cybersecurity issues only elevate these concerns within government and businesses alike, and all of our listeners will be reading the headlines, seeing Canadian privacy reform, e-privacy reform in Europe, Russian data localization, European regulation of AI, Australian attempts to attain EU adequacy, and you know, impacts of Brexit, all privacy-related news items, and the list goes on. Data protection is of growing global importance, and several jurisdictions have announced new privacy bills, privacy rights, and data issues which feature in many of the global legislative agendas. Um, lawmakers are weighing in, reining in big tech, trying to limit tracking, trying to protect individuals and deliver um, individual rights. Perceived abuses of the latest tech and innovation is only driving this further. And worse still, for many of our clients, customers demand data protection practices that often go beyond the law or are framed within their own interpretations of that law. Um, so it's hard enough to get to grip with our local privacy laws in the jurisdictions with which we're familiar, let alone keeping up with the laws, the updates, guidance, regulatory noise, case law, and the practical impl impl implications of privacy around the globe. But many of you out there will have a growing international footprint. Um, you have your home law, and then you have privacy laws which impact you, your operations, and your customers, wherever they may be. I think uh, it's fair to say um, it doesn't take you long to realize that there's probably too much privacy law. And that's today. We know this is only going to get worse. So today's webinar hopes to introduce some of those potential strategies for dealing with all this law, how we understand and take stock of what these laws might be saying, how to assess the risks, and some different approaches to deal with all this privacy law across the borders um, that we're all trading and um, acting across. So um, we'll uh, hand it over to the rest of the team. So. Yeah, so before we get going, just for, as a reminder, for those of you who tuned into our last webinar and or have managed to catch it on uh, YouTube, this is sort of a, this one of the top things that Paul and Flick spoke about um, in their top 2020 privacy list, privacy to-do list. Um, so as Mark was sort of alluding to, it is a very hot topic um, for people to consider. And as you can see on the slide, the sort of key questions we're going to be looking at are sort of what, how can you really deal with um, the global approach? What are those challenges of establishing a global, global approach? How can you manage those risks? And what can we expect next? So as Mark was um, sort of mentioned, there are lots of countries with legislation already in place and those with draft legislation. On the slide, you'll see that sort of 64% of countries already have legislation and there's already 8% of other countries are, have draft legislation in, um, coming into force. So, if you look at it on, on that stats, you're already, if, you're already, if we're already struggling, as many businesses are, to keep up to date with what we've currently got, there's even more to come. Um, and there's an interesting stat. It's not just, um, it's not un unreasonable for you to be struggling because in the last uh, 12 months, there's been more privacy legislation than there has been in the last decade. Um, so we'll start to get going. So guys, what are the challenges of businesses can expect when it's establishing a global approach? Um, so just quickly, on a basic level, most modern privacy frameworks existing and emerging tend to protect the same core principles, so lawfulness, accountability, 
fairness, transparency, data minimization, security. And these go back to, they've been around for a long time. They go back to the OECD principles and the um, FIT principles. So the, the good thing about these principle-based laws are that they're technology and sector neutral. And so to some extent, they're future-proof, which means that it allows for flexibility across jurisdictions. But principle-based laws are a bit tricky because they don't give a conclusive answer. So for example, if we look at security it use, and the GDPR, um, it uses terms such as you must process personal data securely by means of appropriate technical and organisational measures. And that raises the question of what's appropriate, which makes it more challenging rather than, say, giving your IT team a specific um, ISO standard to implement. Uh and if I may add, you know, in relation to the point that you that you just mentioned, you know, the the text of the GDPR is actually uh, particularly interesting, right? Because you know, it says, I quote, uh, uh, implement appropriate technical and organizational measures to ensure a level of security appropriate to the risk, including inter alia, as appropriate. So, in the same sentence, you have three times the word <laughs> appropriate, but then, uh, you know, like many of you will have encountered, you know, I'm sure that. Uh, uh, you have different business units who will come to ask you, well, what is appropriate? What do I need to do in my situation? And unfortunately, the text of the GDPR doesn't really provide much uh, guidance. It leaves it open for organizations to decide what is appropriate in their circumstances. And, you know, of course, having principle-based laws, you know, it's good to ensure that the law is flexible, that you don't have to update it uh, uh, even that regularly, you know, whenever you have new technological developments, but then it also means that uh, organizations are left on their own to figure out what they need to do uh, and what is, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know, appropriate. And uh, you, you mentioned the ISO standards, for example, and you know that's, uh, you know, that's a very good example because uh, uh, the, the the ISO 27701 standard, for example, you know, sets. Uh, different requirements uh, in order for organizations to demonstrate their compliance and their compatibility with various privacy regimes throughout the world. So it actually tells you what you, uh, you know, what you need to, to do uh, in order to achieve uh, ISO uh, uh, compliance. And, uh, you know, another area as well, you know, uh, so, so, you, so you mentioned uh, appropriate technical and organizational measures, but then there is also the issue of uh, uh, you know what to do in relation to data breaches as well, and you know I, that's an example that I often like to quote because it's actually very complicated. Right, what you need to do when there is a data breach, uh, because each each country, each jurisdiction has their own set of rules. You know what you need to do when there is a data breach, and uh, for example, you know in the United States, the standard, uh, the sorry, the criteria which triggers a data breach notification is the unauthorized access or acquisition of a limited set of sensitive personal data elements such as uh, the social security number or, or the credit card numbers. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as many of you will recall, the GDPR has a much broader definition of what is a data breach uh, because a data breach under the GDPR is any breach of security leading to a accidental or unlawful destruction, loss, alteration, unauthorized disclosure of or access to personal data. Personal data being, of course, much uh, broader as well in the U in the GDPR than uh, uh, in um, many uh, uh, U.S. state laws. The time frame is different as well. You have 72 hours under the GDPR, whereas uh, many jurisdictions do not impose such uh, tight time frames. What you have to disclose when you have a data breach is also very different. Uh, some states uh, in the U.S. would say, "Well, you need to disclose uh, what actually happened." Other states would say, "Well," No, you shouldn't actually disclose what happened because we are scared that that information could be used by hackers uh, to uh, to teach them, you know, uh, how to uh, breach organizations. So even the contents of the data breach notification will be uh, uh, will be different. So that's uh, you know one of the big challenges I would say uh, to uh, global compliance program is that you can't just say, well, we just did to have one single set of uh, guidelines and we can just roll it out uh, along the world. You may have to take into account uh, uh, local specificities as well. And I think that ties in actually with the nice points, with the next point, sorry. So data subject rights, I'm going to cover it quite quickly because our colleagues have covered the challenges of adopting a global approach to 
data subject rights and actually the next one data processing terms in parts two and three of our Phil Bishop Bite Size Going Global series. So I'm not going to steal their thunder too much but to summarise mm -hmm. When you're thinking about a global approach to data subject rights, you're considering whether you want to afford the same rights to all individuals, no matter where they're located. Um, so, for example, do you want to give GDPR rights to someone in California? And some do, but there's no legal requirement to do so. And going global doesn't necessarily mean giving the same rights to everyone. It could mean um, simply standardising your approach. But being able to differentiate, um, as Paul just mentioned as well, in relation to data breach reporting obligations, being able to differentiate dependent on which law applies and the specific requirement of that law. And our colleagues discussed this in more detail, the complexities of putting in place a, a global rights procedure. And they talk about the common denominator approach. So again, taking the example of timescales for responding to a request you could opt to pick the most prescriptive one, say one month under GDPR. Um, and yeah, as I said, I don't want to go into that too much um, because they've they've discussed it in the podcast. So I definitely recommend giving that a listen and we'll put links in, I think after the, we'll put links in to the follow-up webinar email so that you can have access to that. And secondly, part three of the podcast goes into data processing terms. So if you're super keen, you'll have listened to it, but it was only released in the last 24 hours. So um, I'll forgive you if you haven't listened to it already. But if you're a global business with global customers, global vendors, it's no longer enough to have a data processing agreement with just European terms. And so I quite talk about how to craft those terms without creating a super lengthy data processing agreement and to make sure that it's as deal friendly as possible. And so they go into a bit more detail about the different considerations from a customer perspective and a vendor perspective and the complexities of scoping out the commitments you make to your customers and whether um, an over offering within those agreements. And then finally, the last two, so business buy-in. Um, if you're pushing for a global privacy program, you'll need buy-in from the business. And so it's one thing most organizations have just gone through the compliance GDPR compliance program and now CCPA. And you'll need buy-in from the business to um, budget and resources to roll out changes. And it's whether you can ha you have the resources time and energy to keep going back and updating um those programs with all these new laws i should also sorry paul i should also add to just that it's not even necessarily having the re resources there to update your documents it's making sure that those are actually utilized in the business because if they're just being shoved back in a cupboard or saved on a uh, filing system then actually they're not being utilized and they're not really worth the paper they're written on so it's making sure that if you are updating it for um another data protection legislation in a different country that that is actually being followed and people are up to date so not just that they're following gdpr principles but they're, like they're thinking about other things as well and, Paul? and there is also the issue of uh, some kind of fatigue settling in right because you know you just finished working on gdpr compliance and then now you say well uh, CCPA, what about, uh, for example, the Brazilian LGPD, what about, you know, the laws in other countries, and then at some point people will tell you, well, you know, this is, <laughs> you know, this has got to, to stop, uh, you know, uh, we are just working on uh, privacy compliance, and uh, uh, this, is, this is an issue that lots of organizations are facing as well, is that uh, uh, there has been, there have been lots of different laws which have come in one after the other, and uh, at some point, you know, people just get tired of it. And they just keep looking at us and saying, oh, there's those privacy folk again come to tell us to do something different. Well, I guess that's why grounding your compliance model in commitments to principles should benefit you no matter what the change is, or at least give some kind of flexibility um, across jurisdictions and to keep up with, with changes. Yeah. Okay, so there's sort of a few of the challenges which we've identified. Um, but really, it's going to be difficult. It's difficult to comply generally as a, per a global approach. But one of the main things we also get asked is, what is the risk? What if I just look at that and say, I'm not bothering, don't worry about it. 
Um, often there's a heavy focus on GDPR fines. That's what people, that's why people say, seem to stand up and listen when the GDPR uh, came into force because they were panicking. Oh, wow, I'm going to get a huge whacking great fine. But there are other risks that you probably do need to consider, which might be more relevant to, to you. So as Charlie said, yeah, the fines are very much at the forefront of people's minds, but it could be that the fine is uh, a drop in the ocean compared to other financial risks. So, for example, cleanup costs um, after a data breach could outweigh the, the regulated fines. And yeah, and there was an interesting statistic. Well, they say that this it completely outweighs it, but I think recently they did publish that it was Equifax from their 2017 data breach have recorded something like $1.4 billion worth of cleanup costs just to deal with that breach. So they're still feeling the effects of it today. Yeah, and, and yeah, I think it's, yeah, there's a lot of focus on fines, as we've said. The, I think one of the things we experienced as team out here in Silicon Valley in the build up to GDPR is during 2017, Q2, well, Q3 and Q4, clients started to realize they uh, were getting more and more pressure from customers to sign sufficient uh, pro processing terms and to offer GDPR assurances ahead of the uh, 25th of May deadline the year later. So uh, customer pressure was forcing compliance before the law even came into, into effect. It was customers in Europe that were nervous about their own compliance looking ahead towards compliance demanding those terms and we had a number of clients came to us and said we've left deals on the table in q3 because we haven't got a frictionless process we don't have our approach for dpa sorted out we haven't got a response to gdpr we need that response we need to be able to deal with that eff efficiently in order to uh you know, make sure we close those deals in q4 and beyond so you know nothing to do with fines nothing to do with you know going to going to jail nothing to do with any other kind of reputational risk. It was simply about being able to, to close deals and uh, not leave revenue sat there uh, because you weren't able to uh, conform to the expectations of, well, both the law and, and of customers. And in relation to fines, you know, I guess, historically the focus was more on the, uh, you know, what happens when there is a data breach uh, because that's when regulators start to look into what they're doing and so forth. But then, uh, you know, recently uh, there have been a bigger focus, I would say, from the regulators in relation to what is actually being uh, uh, done by organizations, even in the absence of any data breach. You know, how do you collect data? What do you do with it? How do you process it? And uh, uh, this is not just, you know, an issue in relation to, uh, uh, you know, the, the GDPR, because, uh, you know, you had two big cases last year, actually, uh, uh, you know, from a U.S. perspective in relation to children's privacy, uh, you know, topic which has also often been uh, uh, overlooked. So whenever uh, you have uh, websites or online services who collect personal information uh, relating to children without, uh, uh, you know, making sure that they have a valid uh, parental consent. You know, that's also an area that uh, has received a lot of uh, scrutiny uh, uh, from uh, from regulators. Uh, you know, in the U.S. So in February last year, you had the operators of the video social networking app Musically, uh, which is now known as TikTok. Uh, and uh, they had to pay 5.7 million US dollars after the US Federal Trade Commission alleged that the company did not comply with uh, children's privacy law. So according to the FTC, the, the website uh, collected personal information from children without notifying parents about the app's collection. Uh, there was, uh, the issue was that, well, you had information being collected from individuals under the age of 13 without parental consent. Uh, and the information was not deleted as well uh, at the request of the parents, according to the FTC. And then a few months later, you had uh, another big uh, case, uh, uh, you know, by the FTC against uh, against YouTube, uh, where the company was fined 170 million US dollars. And again, the issue was uh, collecting personal information. Uh, in this case, in the form of persistent identifiers that are used to track users across the internet uh, from viewers of uh, child directed content without first notifying parents uh, and getting their consent. Brilliant. So that's all the time. Um, but what can we actually do and what can businesses do to manage that global risk? Uh, so I guess the, you know, the, the, the first step will always be, well, you have to to, to realize that uh, you know it is impossible uh, for uh, you know to achieve uh, global compliance with all the laws 
everywhere. Uh, you know, of course, if you are a very large international organization, you know, you may have the resources to look into detail uh, in, uh, and, you know, examine each and every uh, new draft privacy law which is coming up and then to set up a compliance program for each and every uh, different privacy law. Uh, but I suspect that most organizations would not have uh, the time and resources to do this and they would not be able to, uh, in, in, you know, to have such a uh, far-reaching uh, program in place. Uh, in, Instead, you know, a global organization, they should uh, consider building a global privacy program, which uh, describes, you know, the main features of their uh, privacy uh, uh, compliance based on common privacy principles or themes such as uh, transparency, accountability, and, you know, when necessary, they should then create uh, supplemental disclosures uh, or sections for specific countries or regions. Now, you know, I'm not suggesting that, uh, you know, you don't have to comply with the laws of, uh, of you know, the different countries. That is not at all what I'm, uh, what I'm saying here. So don't say that, you know, I, oh, I've heard on a webinar that, uh, uh, you know, some people are suggesting that we don't have to comply with the laws of every country. Uh, you know, no, this is not what I'm saying. Uh, you know, instead, uh, you should identify, you know, your your actual risk and your commercial drivers because, you know, maybe you have some laws, you know, which do not necessarily apply to you. For example, you know, do, are you actually targeting, uh, you know, users in, in a specific country? That's often a criterion which is used as well, you know, by laws to, uh, you know, to trigger, uh, uh, you know, the applicability of, of the laws to, you know, check whether you are actually within the scope of that uh, law. Uh, and, uh, it, it, you know, the, the next step would be to then identify, you know, your, your, your actual risk, you know, what is your company's footprint in that country? Do you have a local presence? Uh, you know, what is your user base in that country and so forth? Because uh, let's say that you only have, uh, you know, one customer who has purchased something on your website, uh, uh, in, you know, in the past uh, 12 months, then, you know, it may not necessarily be, uh, you know, worth your time and effort. Uh, uh, you know, to engage in a very lengthy and complex compliance program uh, for the law of that country, especially if you know and you can demonstrate that you are not uh, doing anything in relation to the country, you're not targeting residents in that, in, in that country. Uh, you know, I said to, to look at the, the, the user base as well, because, you know, the, the numbers, you know, is often, you know, very uh, uh, instructional. Uh, in, in my previous job, uh, uh, you know, I'm aware that, uh, you know, some regulators, they would actually come and ask organizations, well, what is, uh, you know, what is your user base? How many, uh, how many customers do you have in that specific country? And, you know, if you say, well, uh, we have uh, uh, 50,000 customers in the country, well, the, the regulator is then going to ask you, well, okay, then, you know, uh, how can you say that you're not targeting the uh, users in that country if, uh, uh, you have 50,000 customers, so you have to also look at your user base and try to understand, you know, what are you actually doing in the market, you know. Of course, having a website in a country doesn't necessarily mean that you're targeting individuals, but then, you know, are there any other uh, efforts, you know, which are done to target or, or to cater to customers in different countries? So, uh, you know, I would say this is uh, one of the key points. And then, uh, most privacy laws also address and and look at you know common themes. Uh, for example, you know I mentioned earlier transparency. I mentioned note, uh, notice as well. Uh, uh, you have breach notification procedures, individual rights, uh, reasonable security measures. So, so those are themes you know which uh, appear in uh, the laws of you know virtually almost every uh, uh, jurisdiction so far. So you know if you focus on those topics. Uh, then, uh, you know, you should already be, you know, uh, well in your path towards uh, compliance. Of course, uh, in relation to disclosure, you know, there may be certain additional disclosures that you may need to, uh, to perform um, to, to cater to uh, certain uh, specific uh, requirements. For example, in California, you may have to disclose certain additional information, uh, which don't have to do uh, under the laws of other countries. Uh, and, uh, I'll, that's, uh, that's about all, um, what I wanted to say in relation to actual risk. And then decide what you want to achieve as well. Uh, so, you know, you have already decided that, you know, those are the key principles. And then, you know, maybe you want to, to have, you know, a robust compliance program. And, you know, what do you actually want to achieve? Do you just want to, uh, you know, run with the pack? So do you just want to do what is 
uh, standard, you know, what is market practice to do what your competitors are doing? Otherwise, do you want to adopt best practices? You know, do you want to go actually, you know, beyond what everybody else is doing? And do you want to adopt uh, the, the best practices? Or otherwise, uh, do you want to, uh, uh, you know, to adopt aggregate principles? Do you also want, you know, to, uh, to simply, you know, uh, cater to, uh, you know, the, the common principles, uh, you know, which are found in the, the laws of most jurisdictions? Yeah, that's, I mean, I think that's really, really good, Paul, because I think effectively you're saying if you can set a benchmark and then set out an agreed set of rules in relation to the data that you're handling, you're then in a position to push out those rules across your business. Then you can deliver a level of compliance in multiple countries. That level of compliance should meet some of those common standards that you're talking about. And that starts to deal with some of the early sort of perception. Like, I can't deal with all of this, there's too much. Well, let's boil it down into things that we can do. Um, you may not understand every legal requirement, but you can most. And then there are operational good practices which you can put in across your business. But, but where do you start in order to sort of put in those operational uh, good practices? I think you know, inevitably some of this comes down to knowing your data. Um, and you know, we talk about this again and again, but understanding what data you process, in what countries, for what purposes, and then where that data is transferred and to which third parties that's transferred to, you start to get on top of where your risks are. As Paul says, if you start to know your data, you know your customer base, you can start to break down to, to really under, you know, understand where those, where those risks lie. But in terms of a framework, we're often asked, say, hey, Phil Fisher, you know, what kind of controls frameworks have you got? Have you got a GDPR control framework? I've kind of talked about this on some of the webinars before because principle-based rules don't always break down into simple control frameworks. It isn't off or on, it isn't black or white. There's often gray areas, there's often room for interpretation. So it's not always simple to break down to a framework. However, frameworks can be good starting points. Paul, at the beginning of this seminar or webinar was already talking about ISO. You've got ISO 27001 and SOC 2 around security standards, good to demonstrate security, good frameworks to demonstrate security, but good security doesn't always deliver all the privacy that you need because privacy goes further. It's a foundational element of a number of other privacy things. Now, ISO 27001, if you have that as a secure operational security standard, you can actually build on top of that with the ISO 27018 that Paul was talking about. It's a framework for additional privacy practices, which may give you some pointers, which may give you something that you can aggregate across your business. So they're starting points, probably not the best one, uh, one of the things a number of clients talked to is GDPR. It was one of the earliest standards. It's clearly had an influence in relation to some of the other laws which are coming out. CCPA, L uh, the, the, the Brazilian laws, um, elements of some of the other Australian and others that are coming through, all are influenced by GDPR. If you can model some practices around one framework, if you've got a higher standard, it's going to be complex um, and perhaps too extreme to model to entirely, but it could be a good rule to start modeling out to around the globe. There are a lot of debates then about whether you're doing too much in certain countries and whether you can really meet all of those standards and whether that's too, too high a standard to achieve. But GDPR principles will often get you a long way there in a number of countries until you get across uh, topics like localization or security breach and some of the things you know, Paul has talked about earlier on. There's also the OECD, um, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. In the 80s, they brought out a core set of guidelines based on eight principles that should have been uh, and could be applied to both public and private sectors. And um, you know, Megan alluded to these earlier, you know, collection and limitation principles, quality of data principles, purpose specification, use limitation, safeguarding and security, as well as openness and transparency and accountability. A lot of European law was built upon them. Um, and those laws were aimed, or not, it wasn't laws, they're guidelines, but those guidelines were aimed at facilitating free trade and helping businesses come up to common data processing practices so it was easier to trade. So some of the OECD might you know, sort of be built in um, to, to the principles you set. You can also turn to the FIPS, the Fair Information Practices, um, the United States FTC's Fair Information Practice Principles, 
are guidelines representing sort of widely accepted concepts concerning fair information practices in the electronic marketplace criticized for not being thorough criticized for being self you know self certification and you know allowing businesses to set their own standards but it is a starting point and a starting point that you could well consider and i think we're finding a number of businesses even if they're looking at pockets of law and important highlights of law um, which are out there in different countries are starting to come up with a common framework sometimes a framework which they lean heavily on some of those principles which i've talked about sometimes one which they design for their own business based around some of these common concepts so at least you set yourself a set of rules to live by if you've got a good set of rules to live by that's a good benchmark you're already bringing the practices of your business up close to what a number of the laws around the globe are expecting smaller businesses will find this a really good tool to uh, start to align practices and build out it also gives you something to talk to when you go out to your business the biggest ch challenge with privacy is operationalizing the privacy if you've got principles you can distill them into a couple of pages eight core rules to live by everyone in the business can start to understand why choice is important what's the point of transparency why we keep things secure and then you can build on policy and, uh, and work with other departments hr or security or or infosec or others within your business to to start to achieve some of those rules and live by those rules in whatever company uh, whichever countries uh, you're operating in um, there's also of course your contractual frameworks and the promises that you make to your customers where primarily you're a processor or you're acting on behalf of others you should never turn your back on the commitments you're making under those contracts because they're very key to your business they're very key to your customers and they also set another set of fundamental rules so and, you know you should probably just sort of sign off that idea of having a framework you probably also have to have a nod to binding corporate rules um, many will have heard of bcrs and of course there are originally a regulator made, made set of law in europe now been codified into the gdpr but a set of binding rules that once in place within an organization allow that organization to transfer personal data outside of the ea and in compliance with the gdpr um, despite being an eu originated framework bcrs are increasingly attracting a wider recognition and appeal um, they can be adapted and expanded to comply with national laws and not just the EU laws, but also uh, across other areas. You can morph BCR compliance into APEC transfer principles. And of course, the BCRs are about transferring data uh, between group entities, but they also they achieve the ability to transfer data because they set a common set of standards wherever that data is within a group and however that data is handled so you can go all the way and get those bcrs approved and um, accepted by the regulators you could also decide to start building your business around bcrs with a view to moving and getting those approved in the future and we're working with a few clients working on kind of what we could call bcr light effectively starting to develop the principles modeled on the european frameworks with a long-term view of moving towards bcr but knowing that it's a good common framework whether you're a controller or whether you're a processor, um, and it's an easy way of implementing rules across your business. So having an overriding structure of policy, having a binding mechanism or some kind of rules that individual entities will live by, and then dealing with those common standards, dealing with you know, common ways of da handling data subject rights, dealing with government access, performing regular audit, review and updates, all can be amended, extended to a group in order to deliver better compliance with global data privacy laws. And we're spending quite a lot of time talking about that with, uh, with our clients, but um, also that's felt that it's a useful framework for communicating ob obligations and rolling out those obligations, but it's also a useful standard in from a defensive stance if regulators ever come to talk to you because you're starting to model around something which is common and recognized so i think that's that's you know for the, for the larger business or the growing business that's getting more mature and more sophisticated about its privacy program definitely an alternative to consider so. brilliant thanks mark so uh well, we mentioned at the beginning that there are some draft legislation coming into force this year but what can we expect what lies ahead for what, what com companies this year yeah, so if we think back to that statistics slide we had at the beginning, 8% of countries in the world have draft bills. And so those due in force this year, we've got 
South Korea, India, Indonesia, and Thailand. Mark um, spoke about Australia briefly in the introduction, following its digital platforms inquiry, and the government committed to undertake an economy-wide review of privacy laws. And it's announced um, it will be introducing a binding privacy code in 2020, and I believe that's expected in the coming months which will apply to the collection and processing of personal information by social media platforms and other digital platforms. Mark also mentioned Canada, and I believe Canada has a mandate to establish a new set of online rights for citizens. There's also obviously the developments in the US, we spoke a bit about CCPA, but there's others at state level that have data protection on the agenda for 2020 or putting it back into the agenda after they were stalled um, in 2019. And there was also still the talk of a potential federal uh, uh, privacy law, you know, the a law which, an overarching law, you know, which uh, would be very helpful for organizations you know, so that they don't have to look at uh, the laws in each different state and that they could just, you know, rely on a federal standard. So there is a lot of uh, uh, push uh, towards that one, but then I guess we'll see whether it actually uh, comes to fruition or not. And I'm not sure we can get away with finishing this slide without mentioning that dreaded word Brexit. Aha, Brexit. Yes. Um, so, um, and it, a dreaded word. In fact, I think everybody has been instructed in government in the UK not to call it Brexit anymore. I believe it's now decoupling. We're trying to put Brexit behind us because Brexit has been done. Of course, although it's been done in name, it hasn't been done in principle. And we really don't know what Brexit means and what will happen at the end of the transition period. It's another example of potential fragmented law. Yes, the UK has implemented uh, the GDPR. It has the Data Protection Act of um, 2018 on its books and GDPR like laws. And until the end of the year, we'll be, on, we'll be operating um, uh, you know, alongside the EU. Now, for a long time, we suspected um, the UK would continue uh, with its uh, similar principles and would look for adequacy. Uh, so to be recognized as a recipient uh, of data um, uh, and an adequate territory by the European uh, Commission after the uh, transition period. And that state may still happen. Just this week, we've seen various EDPS and other uh, narratives coming out around how that adequacy may work out. But we've also seen a couple of signals from UK government that uh, maybe divergence is on the cards. It's possible that the UK may be taking a different trajectory, and that's the sort of thing we need to look at this year. I'm sure the UK will continue to live up to similar and yeah, pretty much equivalent principles, even though it won't be GDPR in name. But let's watch this space. It's another example of fragmentation, of more law, and potentially more risks to assess and to understand as as we move along. But um, you know, no answers there. I'm sure we'll be having some webinars and potentially the occasional podcast on this topic in the uh, in the coming months. Brilliant. So as we're drawing to the end, uh, you probably sat there and thought, wow, there's a lot of information to take in, but what do I go away and do now? So just some sort of key takeaways from the webinar. Okay, so well, look, thank you very much. We've talked about the fact there's too much law. That's how I kicked off this session. Um, and I think Paul and uh, and Megan and Charlie have all talked about you know the fact you have essentially have to take some kind of risk based approach and start um, setting your own kind of standards and your own kind of approach. And depending on your size and depending on your resources, that may be based on the risks you perceive, that may be based on customer expectation, that may be based upon a understanding as many of the laws as you can and complying as best you can, or it may be um, you know, looking to find some kind of principles to run with. But essentially, I think we would recommend you have, uh, for most businesses listening to this call, you have to accept that global compliance with all laws everywhere is pretty much impossible. Whilst policies and controls will provide compliance, um, they may, you know, you can never really manage all those foreseen compliance risks and you can't cover every you know, possible eventuality. You can react, but it's hard to be fully proactive. Um, therefore, you need to be identifying your actual risk, looking at potential risk factors that we've talked about, looking at the likelihood of those risk factors, and then sit down as a team and a group and decide what you want to achieve. Some of that's uh, based around best practice, 
Some of that will based, be based around legal practice. Some of that will be around contractual expectation. Uh, but you need to set your own standards. Paul talked about running with the pack, you know, comparing yourself to others, dealing with risk, risk, of, uh, you know, risk optimization. You know, maybe it's about putting as least effort in as possible because things are changing. But you need to understand where your benchmark will be set. Then you need to design your own form of compliance framework working out how to aggregate and at best reach some of those standards um, by uh, doing very similar things in multiple countries as best you can. Of course, some of the public entities out there will be lucky. They'll have a lawyer in every country. They'll be able to look at law. But for the most part, the, the businesses that uh, we're dealing with and many of you on this call will be looking for a framework that works. And then they'll be looking for the bright spots based on risk based on compliance, where you may have to fill in gaps, where do you have to overachieve in relation to the benchmark you set, and where do you need to underachieve, and what are you going to do in order to, to deliver that. And then importantly, as is always the challenge, it's fine if you know in a small privacy team, what are you going to do in order to push this out, to operationalize this, to get the business around you working to these standards, but also to win the hearts and minds of others around the globe to get them understanding these principles and working to them. So you're all pulling as a team in order to deliver uh, privacy compliance as best you can. And ultimately, what we're all trying to achieve, protect individuals' data, protect their rights, and uh, get on with the businesses as best we can. Brilliant. Well, thank you, uh, everyone. And thanks, thank you all for listening. Um, I was pleasantly surprised that we are rounding up at exactly our 45 minute mark when I try and finish this slide. Um, but then I shouldn't be so impressed because we have got three podcasts on this subject already. Um, there was a couple of questions regarding the podcast. So to be able to access those, if you just go on to, um, to your podcast app and search for Phil Fisher, you should be able to find it or uh, search on SoundCloud for Field Fisher Silicon Valley. You'll be able to find the uh, three podcasts on this, but also subscribe because there'll be upcoming uh, podcasts on different topics related to privacy. Um, we, as with all our webinars, this will be uploaded to uh, YouTube. Um, so please, if there's anything you missed, um, you can rewatch it on there. Um, unfortunately, I can see there are a few questions, um, but we haven't got time to answer those today. If uh, you still have them and they're not answered in our podcast, please do send over an email and we'll see what we can do. Uh, but once again, thank you for listening.